Hello, my name is Ramiro La Fuente, and welcome to the mini course on Einstein manifolds with symmetry. I prepared for the third geometric analysis festival. So before I start, let me thank the organizer, Hojo Lee, for the invitation to present this series of talks. I hope you will enjoy it. Uh, as the title indicates, uh, I will be talking about Einstein Riemannian manifolds uh, with a bit of symmetry and these talks are based on the recent joint work with Christoph Boom that will appear on the archive this coming Monday, hopefully. And yeah, so let me start by introducing what Einstein manifolds are. So a Riemannian manifold is called Einstein if it has constant Ricci curvature. That is, the Ricci tensor is a multiple of the metric tensor. Remember, these are zero two type tensors on the manifold. So it makes sense to write such a such an equation. And what type of equation is that, right? So of course it is stronger than saying that the manifold has constant scalar curvature, but it is much weaker than asking for constant sectional curvature. So from the from an analytic point of view, this is a very complicated second order weakly elliptic PDE, it's weakly elliptic because it's invariant under the diffeomorphism group. And so it can be made elliptic by choosing suitable coordinates and breaking the gauge. So for instance, in harmonic coordinates, the, the metric entries GIJ in these coordinates satisfy this uh, PDE, second order PDE, right? This is a Laplace Beltrami operator. And Q is just quadratic term depending on GIJs and on their first derivatives. And of course, well, the right hand side is the same as the original right hand side, right? But it turns out that this is uh, very involved and it's typically hard to construct examples in particular in the compact world. Now from a geometric point of view, that's a very natural characterization of Einstein metrics as critical points of the, again, very natural Einstein-Hilbert functional on a compact manifold, which is sometimes you can say that you normalize volume to be one, but you can also write it as the following. So consider the total scalar curvature of your manifold and then normalize it so that this functional is scale invariant. And then the critical points are precisely uh, Einstein metrics. And so this variational point of view is uh, very useful for, well, in certain cases, one can construct examples by exploiting this, this variational principle. Um, the questions that one is interested in when studying Einstein metrics are, of course, given M, whether there exists such a metric, whether there are just one or, or many of them, and what are their geometric properties, and do they impose any topological restrictions on the manifold? Right? And finally, of course, uh, we want to understand the space of Einstein metrics on a fixed manifold up to up to isometry. So that's what's called the moduli space. Um, let me mention before we start that in this talk lambda, the Einstein constant, will be assumed to be negative, right? So of course, the other cases, lambda zero, so the Ricci flat case, and lambda positive are extremely important as well. But for the sake of simplicity, uh, I will assume throughout that lambda is minus one in this talk. And perhaps my intention is not to give a, a survey on Einstein manifolds. I could talk for, for a little while about them, but let me just point the interested uh, audience in, in this direction. So there's, of course, uh, the book of Bese titled Einstein Manifolds. That's a, it's an excellent reference for starting with, uh, with Einstein metrics. Uh, and then there's a bunch of surveys which are uh, of different flavor uh, focused on different aspects of the theory, uh, but extremely well written. So I, I would recommend you uh, go through them to, to find other references as well. 
uh, perhaps for this talk, the, the most relevant surveys are those by Wang and Loret, uh, because they are focused on situations where there is symmetry assumptions. <clears throat> So let me mention some examples of Einstein manifold, right? So remember the Einstein constant will be normalized to be minus one. And the first examples come actually from algebra. And by that, I mean the irreducible symmetric spaces. So I mentioned already, or I didn't mention, but it's clear that the manifold with constant sectional curvature is an example of an Einstein manifold. But more generally, any irreducible symmetric space such as complex hyperbolic space or quaternionic hyperbolic space, they're also automatically Einstein with their natural symmetric metric. And this was proven by, uh, this was an observation by Cartan uh, in 1929. Um, it's, it's, very, it's actually almost for free. When you understand what's going on, you don't have anything to prove. Essentially, uh, the, the equation is solved by representation theory by Schur's lemma. So that's why I say they come for free. Uh, so the more general example in this uh, negative case, so when the space has to be non-compact, one can write uh, an irreducible symmetric space as a quotient of a simple non-compact Lie group by a maximal compact subgroup K. And, and they admit a unique up to scaling G invariant I, uh, Riemannian metric, and it turns out that this invariant Einstein metric is Einstein. For the sake of concreteness, uh, some explicit examples are given by SLNR mod SON, or SLNC mod SUN, or well, SOPQ mod this group, etc. So these are very explicit uh, homogeneous spaces, symmetric spaces, right? And they all give example of Einstein manifolds with negative scalar curvature. Very classical objects in mathematics and geometry, for sure. Now, an observation of Borel, not an observation, you have to prove this and it's non trivial, but they all have compact quotient, namely, there's uh, discrete uh, groups acting by isometries uh, properly discontinuously, uh, where the corresponding Orbit space is compact. Now, secondly, because this is a PDE, it's not surprising that the, there's a family of examples coming from analysis. It took a while until these were found, and it was like a great breakthrough when they were. Uh, and this is work due to Owan and Yao almost simultaneously in the 70s and in the Keller setting. So, Keller Einstein manifolds arise by solving a very complicated PDE on a compact Keller manifold. So the result is that if one has a compact Keller manifold with negative first turn class, negative definite first turn class, then there's a unique Keller metric on the same Keller class, which solves the Einstein equation. And again, the solution involves actually solving the PDE or proving existence more than solving, right? It's not explicit. You don't get like the explicit metric, but uh, one can prove existence by the continuity method. And <clears throat> there are further examples arising from analysis. <clears throat> I will say that these are constructions that are somehow related to hyperbolic geometry in one way or another. And and they are typically very technical on the analytic side of things. Um, but they provide example of compact Einstein manifolds with negative Einstein constant. The remarkable thing is that as far as I know, these are all known compact examples of Einstein manifolds with negative Einstein constant. Right? So it turns out that it's very tricky to construct examples of these manifolds. Now, on the other hand, non-compact examples are a bit easier to find, not, not that they are trivial, but there's a very general construction by uh, Raham and Lee, where they consider deformations of the hyperbolic metric on the hyperbolic 
and space. And one can show that there's an infinite dimensional family of Einstein deformations of these metrics. Right? So that provides a lot of complete non-compact Einstein manifolds with negative Einstein constant. And perhaps more related to, to what we will be discussing in this series of talks uh, is the fact that one can also consider Einstein deformations of the symmetric spaces, right? It sounds weird at first sight because the symmetric spaces involve simple Lie groups, right? And simple Lie groups or simple Lie algebras are very rigid objects, right? There's only finitely many in each dimension, they're completely classified. So it's hard to imagine how one can deform these and stay within the class of homogeneous spaces. Uh, but there's a way of doing it by looking at this object as solved manifolds. And, and I will discuss this uh, in more detail in the following slides. So okay, let me erase this. So what are homogeneous Riemannian manifolds? A Riemannian manifold is called homogeneous when its isometry group acts transitively on, on it. So there's enough symmetry so that you can take any point and map it onto any other point by an isometry of the manifold. This sounds very restrictive, of course it is, but uh, at the same time, it provides uh, a huge family of very nice examples <clears throat> in Riemannian geometry. So it turns out that as a differentiable manifold, such a, such a space is always diffeomorphic to a homogeneous space. So the quotient, this is what's called a homogeneous space. The quotient of a Lie group G, you pick any G inside the isometry group, which still acts transitively on M. And then you look at the, the stabilizer or the isotropy group at some point P in M. I call it H for simplicity. And, and it turns out that by very basic theory of differential geometry, you can see that there's a diffeomorphism between this homogeneous space G mod H and your manifold M. Now H has to be a compact subgroup because it turns out that this is a closed subgroup of, can be viewed as a closed subgroup of the orthogonal group of the tangent space at P. So that's why it's a, it's a compact Lie group. All right, so we will be studying this uh, in detail in this talk. First example, well, I've mentioned already a bunch of examples. The symmetric spaces are in particular homogeneous spaces because the metric is G invariant. And another huge family of examples, which are perhaps simpler from the algebraic point of view is uh, any Lie group with a left invariant metric. And by that, I mean, you look at the tangent space at the identity of your Lie group G, and that's naturally identified with the Lie algebra of the Lie group, then you pick any inner product on the Lie algebra, and then you use left translations, which are these maps that any Lie group or any group has, but in the case of Lie groups, sorry, this is Y mapping to X times Y. These are diffeomorphisms, and, and they, of course, give an action of G on itself, which is transitive. So you can use these diffeomorphisms to extend your inner product, which is a finite the identity, to any tangent space of your Lie group. And that defines what's called a, a G invariant, a left invariant Einstein, a, a left invariant Riemannian metric, sorry. Which of course depends on the inner product you started with. Right? So it's clear that there's a there's some freedom for constructing examples in this setting. Now, uh, an observation, a topological observation is that homogeneous spaces have a topology which is concentrated in the topology of a compact homogeneous space. So namely, you can always find K maximal compact subgroup of G such that it contains H. And then these are the maximal compact subgroup of a Lie group are unique up to conjugation and then G mod H can be seen to be homotopy equivalent to K mod H 
which is a compact homogeneous space. So the topology from a certain point of view is always contained in this K, right? And so it all boils down to understanding what happens on K mod H. All right. Now, what's our setup? We are studying homogeneous Riemannian manifolds and let's throw in the additional Einstein assumption, right? So we have a homogeneous space G mod H and we're looking for solutions to the equation rich G equals minus G on G invariant metrics. So these are homogeneous metrics, which are at the same time Einstein. So what about the existence? Well, first of all, let me mention that even though the Einstein equation is a very complicated PDE in the homogeneous case, because you're getting rid of the derivatives in a certain way, the Einstein equation is in fact equivalent to an algebraic equation. And one can see that in the case of left invariant metrics very easily because pick any left invariant G orthonormal frame, which is a global frame on G, and then look at the take look at the Lie brackets, right? They will give rise to the structure coefficients. They of course depend also on the metric because I picked the left invariant orthonormal frame. And then the Einstein equation becomes this very involved system of polynomial, second order polynomial uh, equations for the structure coefficients. Um, well, and it sounds like well, one should be able to solve this, right? But algebraic equations are unfortunately not always that easy to solve, right? And so this can become very involved very easily when you start rating the dimension. But still, uh, these are the Einstein equations. And lots of examples are known in the case of negative Einstein constant. And they happen to be all isometric to some Einstein solved manifold. So by that, I mean a left invariant Einstein metric on a Lie group, which is solvable. And by solvable, I don't want to define what it means, but you can think of Lie groups which are uh, somehow subgroups of the, the group of upper triangular invertible matrices. That's a, that's a good way of thinking about solvable Lie groups, right? So they're very different, like the opposite of semi-simple in, in, in the algebra theory and the groups theory. And well, the, the, the Lie group has to be simply connected also and the metric left invariant. The observation is that topologically these are trivial, so it's diffeomorphic to Euclidean space. That's a fact that one can prove uh, in Lie theory by induction. Um, there's a lot of examples. Uh, it's impossible, it's almost impossible to classify them because there's so many. Um, this should be compared with a very rigid situation from symmetric spaces, right? Uh, so just to give you a, a hint of how many they, there are, I mean, there's a 46 dimensional family in dimension, you know, 16 of homogeneous Einstein deformations of the quaternionic hyperbolic four space. Is, was proved by Hebert in 98. And there's nothing special about 16 or about hyperbolic, uh, quaternionic hyperbolic space. It's, uh, there's just lots of infinite dimensional families in higher dimension. So perhaps an interesting property that they all share is that they are all solved manifolds, uh, simply connected solved manifolds. So in particular, they're all diffeomorphic to Rn. And so there is this uh, long standing open question about Einstein homogeneous spaces with negative constant. And due to Alexievsky in the 70s, he conjectured that such an M must be diffeomorphic to a Euclidean space. Not isometric, of course, but just diffeomorphic. So this is the focus of our recent preprint. I just re re uh, state what I just summarized in the previous slide. And now our main result, collaboration with Christoph Boom, is that the conjecture holds in all dimensions. Namely, 
we prove a little bit more that any homogeneous Einstein space with negative Einstein constant must be isometric to an Einstein solved manifold. So in particular, these are all simply connected, so diffeomorphic to, to a Euclidean space. Right? So the main goal of the, the series of talks is to explain some aspects of the proof, hopefully by simplifying um, maybe some algebraic complications and focusing on analytic geometric arguments. But before moving into that, let's, uh, let's mention previous results regarding the Alexievsky conjecture. So it was known to hold, quote unquote, if dimension is up to 10. Uh, by that, I mean, up to finitely many exceptions, uh, the conjecture holds, was known to hold in these dimensions. This is due to work by Nikonorov in 2005 and joint work with Romina Arroyo, uh, and then work by a student of mine, Roy Berishan, uh, later last year. Then one of the such exceptions is a bit embarrassing to state, but it was not known if the Lie group SL2C, which is a simple Lie group diffeomorphic to S3 cross R3, so by the conjecture should not admit asymmetrics. It was open whether this there is left invariant isometrics on this Lie group or not. So, so that's perhaps remarkable if, because it seems like it should be very easy to check using the algebraic equation, but that's how complicated they are, right? Even for these low dimensional examples, it's very hard to tell uh, whether they have solutions or not. There's another. Uh, partial result by Nikonorov, uh, where he proved that on semi-simple Lie groups for a certain very special type of left invariant metrics, the conjecture holds. And then there's um, joint work with uh, my PhD advisor, Jorge Lauret, and, and then after that, and work by Chablonska Peters, and we obtained the structure results for Einstein homogeneous spaces with negative Einstein constant. By structure, I mean, we proved certain compatibility between the Lie algebraic part of the picture and the geometry. So there's a there's certain non-trivial relations that are satisfied by uh, by the Lie bracket in terms of uh, the metric that is Einstein. And from that, one can deduce, one can prove that uh, this was done by by Chernovsky and Peterson that the group, the transitive group, which I now call F. I changed notation, uh, has, must have no compact, can be assumed to have no compact simple factors. Then uh, another non-trivial result is that is due to, to Mike Chablonsky in a paper in 2015, Duke, and also joint work with Christoph a couple of years ago, that uh, one can assume that the manifold is simply connected, namely, uh, well, the conjecture holds if the universal cover is diffeomorphic to Rn. So this is essentially the same as saying that you can assume M is simply connected, which is in fact part of the conjecture, right? I should have mentioned that it, perhaps it's actually non-trivial to, to show that one can assume that, but one can and we will do so. All right, so um, perhaps let me indicate how, uh, the proof idea goes. So what's the main difficulty for proving the Alexievsky conjecture is that we don't have a very good understanding of the Ricci curvature of a left invariant metric for semi-simple Lie groups. So I am aware that this is a very vague statement, but you have to trust me in this one. This is my feeling and, and I guess it's a, it's a good feeling. We, we don't know much about the structure of this algebraic expression for the Ricci curvature for semi-simple Lie group. But on the other hand, there's a main advantage and is that the opposite holds for solvable Lie groups. Namely, we have a very good understanding of the Ricci curvature formula and the Einstein equation in particular. So this is due to uh, fundamental work by Jens Heber in his habilitation in 98 and then by, by Jorge Lauret in 2010 and in many other papers and by many other people. I'm not mentioning everything, I'm just quoting perhaps the most important pieces of work, but there's a very good understanding in the solvable case, right? So now 
the key idea for proving the conjecture is the following. You forget about homogeneity assumption. So you throw away your main, your strongest assumption. And the reason we do that is the following. We choose, we look for a solvable subgroup of F, which we call G, that's why I changed notation, which whose action on M is not transitive perhaps, right? So we won't have homogeneity anymore, but a, the quotient space is not longer a point, but it's now still compact, right? So this is extremely important that the quotient by the G action is compact. And then the idea is, well, you study the, the Einstein equation by only looking at the invariance under this non-transitive action of the solvable group G. Right? So this doesn't sound very appealing because now the Einstein equation is no longer a an algebraic equation, but it's now a coupled system of PDEs with algebraic equations coming from the G orbit, right? Now, the good thing is that, okay, the PDE part, it sounds very, uh, well, complicated, as complicated as the general case, right? But the good thing is that on the G orbits, we understand more or less the Ricci curvature. So, so that's what will make this argument work by the main advantage that I mentioned about, right? And on the PDE part, well, that's why we, we really need the, this assumption that B is compact. Um, yeah. So, okay, so now we move on to the, the title of this series of talks which is Einstein manifolds with symmetry because of the, the approach that I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, let me present the main result in our study of Einstein manifolds with non-transitive isometry groups. Uh, so recall first that given L group G, the nil radical is a, its maximal connected nil potent normal subgroup, right? So any L group has a unique nil radical and this n is trivial if and only if g is semi simple, right? So when g is solvable, for instance, n is always non trivial and contains a lot of uh, information from, from g, although not all. So somehow nil potent D groups are even better for the sake of uh, understanding Ricci curvature of left invariant metrics, right? So that's why we focus on this nil radical. And the uh, theorem B which is the main tool used for proving theorem A is the following, given uh, an Einstein Riemannian manifold with negative Einstein constant M, assume that there's a group G acting on M properly and isometrically, uh, where the orbit space M mod G is a closed manifold. So not only compact, but I'm assuming that it's a manifold, right? So essentially, we will assume uh, that you can think that we are assuming that all G orbits are principal, okay? All the isotropy groups are conjugate to one another. Then under these assumptions, there is a foliation of M into pairwise local isometric leaves, which are minimal Einstein submanifolds of dimension, well, the dimension of the new radical plus one, okay? So yeah, at first sight, this doesn't sound too appealing. It's a complicated statement. Um, now the reason it's useful is that it is very general, right? Because we are only assuming there's an isometric action and the orbit is closed. The orbit space is a closed manifold. Right? And, and from that, we are able to obtain something, right? Some non-trivial statements about the geometry. And so that's why this is extremely useful. So imagine G could be two dimensional and, and the orbit space could be of dimension one million, right? So this is a very mild symmetry assumption. But still you are able to conclude that there's some really nice Einstein submanifold and there's a lot of structure on top of that. Namely, these Einstein leaves are N invariant and they're locally homogeneous, perhaps not surprisingly. Now, Regarding the action of the new radical, the n orbits. So of course, I'm implicitly assuming here. I should have mentioned that that's a mistake. N is non-trivial, so G is not semi-simple. 
Uh, the n orbits are locally isometric to a fixed nil soliton. So nil solitons are Ricci solitons, Ricci soliton metrics, which are homogeneous, and they are left invariant, in fact, on a simply connected nil potent nil group. So that means that the geometry of the n orbits is very well understood. Now, another very important fact that we prove is that the orthogonal distribution to the n orbits is integral. So what do I mean by that? Well, there's, a, there's m, right? And there's an action of g, and there's an action of n then, right? So this, suppose that these are the n orbits, okay? So this is n acting on p, n acting on q, right? So the n action induces a distribution given by the tangent spaces of, of M, and this I call the vertical distribution, right? This is an integrable distribution because the, the integral submanifolds are the n orbits. And then by using the Riemannian metric on M, one can look at the orthogonal complement of such a distribution, right? And obtain what's called the horizontal distribution associated with this uh, this in isometric group action, right? So there's no reason why this horizontal distribution should be integral. This is actually uh, a very uh, a very restrictive condition, but we prove that this has to be the case if the Einstein equation is satisfied. And now just to connect with the known results in the in this homogeneous case, perhaps let me mention that. Uh, sorry. Uh, when when the action is transitive, so the quotient space is not just a closed manifold, it's a point, then this theorem B reduces, the statement of theorem B reduces to Hebert's rank one reduction, for those uh, who know what I'm talking about. Uh, if you don't, you can look at Hebert's Inventiones paper where he proves this result. And, and the third item in the furthermore list here, is in fact equivalent to the fact that Einstein solved manifolds are standard, which was proved by, by Jorge Lauret in, in 2010. All right, so yeah, this is the main tool that will make our theorem work. And now, uh, what's the plan for the remaining lectures? Well, in lecture number two, I will try to give an idea for how to prove theorem B, so the, this tool, right? The Einstein, manif the Einstein manifolds with symmetry theorem. The main focus, though, will be made on the, the geometric and analytic arguments and, and not on the Lie theory. I will try to simplify as much as possible Lie theory. Everything will be abelian as, uh, as much as we can uh, so that I can explain what are the, the analytic ingredients. And perhaps some keywords so that you come to the next talk are the following. So I'll talk about isometric group actions, about the Ricci curvature in the context of Riemannian submersion, and about uh, a thing we, we, we discovered, which is the modified Helmholtz decomposition, which is a very important part of the argument. And now lecture three, then we'll focus on the proof of the Alexievsky conjecture, and I will prove it only in the case where M is as a 2C. So this case, although it's much simpler than the general case, it already contains a lot of the key ingredients that are present in the general case. Uh, so I think it's worthwhile uh, considering that those restrictions for the sake of clarity. All right, so this is the end of lecture number one, and I see you in the next one. Bye.